Well, today, our speaker is Ed Paz. He's sitting here on the front row with his wife, Rebecca. They met at Stanford University, where he quickly told me they were not students at the time. But I would have said, just leave that part off, brother, and just tell people we met at Stanford, and then people can think what they think. You know what I'm saying? Okay. They met at Stanford University, actually, in a leadership seminar that the university was hosting. Ed comes from a business background, but in 2010 was called into ministry leadership. 2013 became the founding pastor of the Movement Church in Oakland. The church is thriving, and they are launching their first church plant in September of this uh, of this of 2020. So we're excited about that progress in their lives as well. Um, Dr. Rich Johnstone, a longtime associate and faculty member and partner with Gateway Seminary, is actually an elder in their church, and so we are delighted for the progress they are making. Ed, we are delighted you're here today. Give a warm Gateway welcome to Pastor from the Movement Church. Uh, it is a, a pleasure and an honor to be here today to have the opportunity to share with you um, I'm going to be speaking from the topic, Unexplainable Pain Explained, and in light of Dr. Orge's unfortunate updates around what's going on in his family, things that are going on in our denomination, things that may be going on in your life, I think God um, is going to speak to us today. I'm hopeful that he's going to reveal himself uh, through the different pains that we are going through. And so I'm going to jump right in. Before I get into the actual text, I'm going to be setting up the message a little bit. So for those of you who may be wondering, where's the text? Where's the text? I'll get to the text in just a minute. But I first want to start out with the tension question um, that I believe the scriptures will help us answer by the time I'm finished. Why does God allow the people he created and loves to go through unexplainable pain and suffering? Why would he allow these events and these illnesses that are going on in Dr. Orge's family at this season, why would he allow this? Why would he allow the things that are going on in your life currently that can't be explained, that are frustrating you, maybe things from your childhood that you can't seem to unpack, things currently going on, Lord, I'm in school and I'm doing my best to pursue you, Lord, I'm working for you, yet you are allowing these unexplainable seasons of pain and suffering to take place in my life. God, why do you allow that? And the reason why I want to approach this subject today, I have three what I would call burdens, three reasons why this matters, why I think you should lean in, maybe even take some notes today. Um, number one, unexplainable pain is an inescapable reality. We, we know Peter talks about this. Don't be surprised by the fiery trials that are coming your way as if something strange were happening to you. We are to anticipate the fact that there are unexplainable trials and circumstances that we face in our lifetime, and the scripture is clear about this. And just to orient you to myself a little bit, uh, as Dr. Orge mentioned, have Pastor this church now, a church plant in Oakland, California for the last six years. And just a week before our five-year anniversary, we were so excited. We were going to ordain an additional pastor at the church. We were going to unveil new branding. Come on, somebody. You know you're excited about branding, and we're going to have a new, fresh look for our church. And a week prior to this very big day for our church, I go up uh, to Oregon for a pastor's event, and by five o'clock that afternoon, my eye begins to itch. I think something's wrong with my contact. I asked my wife for some help with that. Um, it wasn't anything wrong with my contact. By 12 midnight, I was in the emergency room, and I would come to later find out that I would have a bacteria called Pseudomonas. Now, if you're squeamish, in any way, shape, or form, I'm about to put up a picture of, of what happened to my eye. And so it, I'm just giving you the warning now. And so after 48 hours, I'm still up in Oregon. This is the picture that my wife took of my eye after 48 hours. Go ahead and put that up. Okay. Yeah, that's like I'm some sort of X-Men character or something like that, some sort of mutant 
And, and so this happened just prior, and you could take off the slide before anyway. Yeah. That's going to be up for the remainder of the... No. So much for <laughs> um, So to this day, I, I cannot see out of my right eye. It's like foggy, like a shower door. I have to get a cornea uh, replacement surgery, and hopes are after this cornea replacement surgery, I'll be able to see again. Lord, why would you allow this to happen? I work for you. Five-year anniversary, new branding. Come on, Lord. My wife and I, we've been married for 15 years, and for 15 years, we've desired to have children. And unfortunately, God has, has not opened those doors. We have not been able to have children. Lord, why? Unexplainable pain of not being able to, to father a child of our own and this event with my eye happened in September of 2018, and then in March of 2019, when we, we say, okay, we're going to really try, do everything we can to have a child, line up the calendars, do all the things you got to do, we find out in March of 2019, my wife has cancer in her uterus. Lord, why? We work for you. We're, we're called to you. Why do you allow these things to happen? And I know these pains aren't unique to me. Just like Dr. Orge said, we could go around and you could all name a pain right now that you can't explain and you would wonder why would God allow this. And so the first reason why I want you to lean in is this is, this is a reality of life. It's a reality too as I get around and talk to different ministers. For some reason, ministers of the gospel seem to experience unusual pains in seasons of suffering. The second burden I have is that simple answers to complex pains are very problematic. See Job's friends, right? right. Tim Keller refers, refers to them as Job's miserable comforters. And at too many points in our lives, we have, especially in the church, we have encountered miserable comforters. Come on, somebody. Oh, God works all things out for the good. You're going to be just fine. Or why don't you just pray? Or why don't you just have more faith? And you're like, come on. I prayed. I have faith for healing. We have faith for a baby. And people prosify, pro prosify, prophesy and give these words of knowledge of how things are just going to be better. And it's pat answers to complex pains. And these can be very damaging. And so as many of you are, are studying to be ministers of the gospel, you are ministers of the gospel. Part of my burden is we cannot be like Job's friends. We cannot have a shallow understanding of pain. Because in having a shallow understanding of pain, we cannot help people see the depths of God's goodness, love, and grace. My third burden is simply this, that many Christians are too quick to attempt to pray away their pain and suffering. I don't have a verse for this. All you have to do is just look at your prayer journal. Come on, somebody. All we have to do is we have to look at our prayer meetings and how often we say, Lord, and I'm not against praying these things away. I'm not against praying for healing. But what if we may be praying away the very tool of sanctification that God has choose, chosen for this season of our life? We may be praying away. You, you say, Lord, make me more like you. Lord, give me more faith. Lord, give me more boldness. And then he chooses to sanctify you and make you more into his image through the vessel of pain. And here we are praying away God's solution to our initial prayer. And so I'm, I'm brokenhearted over how I've viewed pain over my life, how I've seen ministers view pain. And so my outline today Here's how I'm hoping we could come to a conclusion. I want to give you three helpful explanations of unexplainable suffering and pain through the text. We'll see these, and I hope these will be helpful to you. And in many ways, I could stop the message after the three helpful explanations, but you're a bright crowd, you're a deep crowd, you're here... I mean, come on, you, you guys study the Bible like professionally and then you come to a chapel. I mean, you guys are serious. You guys are serious. And so I want to go deeper and I want to point you to uh, one sympathetic comforter. Now, I know you guys know who that is already. 
but I, I am going to, it's going to be Jesus, so I'll just spoiler alert, but hopefully the way I talk about this sympathetic comforter will be uh, particularly encouraging to you. And then I could stop the message there. Typically, you'd stop the message of Jesus. You end with Jesus, right, and play the music, and everyone cries and goes home. But once again, because you're a deep crowd and because I, I just feel like you'd want more, I'm going to go one level deeper and leave you with one uncomfortable question. And um, if you leave before that, really, you've, you've missed it because I think the one uncomfortable question I'm going to leave you with really is the question we have to ask ourselves when it comes to uh, unexplainable pain and suffering. So these three explanations are going to come from a text that you are all very familiar with, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Many of you could probably teach this text better than I can. Um, and so we're going to park here for a little bit, bring out these explanations, and then we'll get into these other parts of the message. But as many of you know, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. It's coming on the heels of Paul explaining to the church at Corinth that God has given him dreams and visions, that he's blessed him with these supernatural abilities. And, and it's in light of these supernatural abilities and experiences that, that Paul has these words to share around the pain and suffering that he's going through even in spite of these visions and dreams and supernatural experiences that he's having. I'm going to read the text in its entirety, and then we're going to go back through it to pull out these three helpful explanations. So uh, let's go ahead and read. So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. I just want to stop right there. A thorn was given me in the flesh. I, I have learned this recently, though I grew up listening to this verse and knowing about this verse. The question has always been asked, what was that thorn? What was that burden? And commentators have three, there's three popular views of what the thorn in the flesh was. The first and most popular is that it was a physical ailment of some sort. That's why it's referred to a thorn in the flesh. And maybe, and, and this makes me feel like I could relate to Paul a little bit, maybe it had something to do with even blindness or partial blindness because we know in another portion of scripture it talks about writing in large letters and so maybe he was doing that because he couldn't see so well. Another explanation for the thorn in the flesh might be something around uh, anxiety uh, because it was a, a, a what does the text say here? A messenger of Satan to harass me or to torment me, some translations say. And so maybe there was something going on in his mind, maybe a depression that he was experiencing. Another explanation was maybe there was just some critics to his ministry, some people who opposed him. And I read one commentary and it said, you know, I don't think we're clear on what it is, because if we were clear on what it was, we would say that this doesn't relate to me. Come on, somebody, right? Because if it was just about blindness, you'd say, well, my pain is different from blindness, so this doesn't apply to me. I'm so thankful that there's some, um, there's, it's not so clear what it is, and it could be a few different things, because I think we could all in the room say, you know what? I've dealt with unexplainable pain that might be physical, I've dealt with unexplainable pain that might be mental. I've dealt with unexplainable pain that has to do with opposition in my life, even in the church, outside of the church. And so I think we all can relate to what Paul has to say here. He goes on to say, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So Paul's like us, pray the pain away. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. A passage we are so familiar with that is so encouraging to so many people during seasons of pain but what are some helpful explanations that we could pull right from the text? Now, 
I'm a simple guy. I, I, we're not going to go super deep. Yeah, this is probably going to be too simple for you, but let's just take a look here. So to keep me from being conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to ra- harass me, to keep me from being conceited. I'm taught as I study the Bible and as a preacher and teacher, if something is repeated, it should probably be considered. You should stop for a second and say, why is he repeating himself? And so here's some very simple exegesis from this passage. What's one of the helpful explanations? Pain prevents your pride. Hopefully you can see the jump I've made there. No gymnastics. It's to keep me from being conceited. Maybe there's something about pain that could prevent our pride. In God taking away, for at least a moment, my eyesight, I was humbled. In the weeks that followed, I could not even study to preach a message. I could not even look at a screen for any length of time because my left eye was compensating, and so it would just grow very weary, very fast. And immediately it came to my mind, I might not be able to ever preach again. In one moment, I love what I'm doing, and and God is using me, and in the next moment, it could be taken away just like that. And in that moment of pain, I was humbled. And I don't know if anything else could have humbled me like the realization that this gift is on loan. That tomorrow is not promised. Tomorrow and how I operate and how I breathe and how I work and how I'm skilled is not promised. And in that moment, pain is doing a humbling work inside of me. How may the pain that you're currently experiencing, a moment of reflection here, let's just not be excited to be able to theologically wrap our heads around what Paul is saying here, but let's do some application in the moment. What hard circumstance may you be currently going through that by God bringing you through that circumstance, he's simultaneously trying to humble you? How may he be trying to humble you through your financial situation? How may he be trying to humble you through the relational issue that you're going through? How may he be trying to humble you through the church issue that you're currently facing? How may he be trying to humble you through the health malady that you may be facing and going through? Let's look at a second helpful explanation for our pain. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. My power is made perfect in weakness. No exegetical gymnastics, let's just take it right from there. The second helpful biblical explanation for pain is simply this, pain perfects God's power. As we go through pain in our lives, he shows off, he glorifies himself, he shows himself as strong through us. With the situation with my eye, God would, in those weeks, he would comfort me. He would show himself as a powerful comforter that I would have never known otherwise. The power of of him to be able to comfort me was perfected in my life. The power for me to sustain in ministry and to keep going regardless of the physical pain of the anxiousness of what's going to happen. The people in our local church were able to see me wrestle with this pain through fear and trembling and, and able to say, wow, look at the God through Edward as he continues to keep his hand to the plow regardless of the rough situation. Look at God 
Things are bad. Things don't look so good, but it seems like God is looking better even in the midst of how bad this circumstance is. How might God be desiring to, using your pain to make his power more perfect in and through your life? Some of you have prayed prayers. God, show yourself as powerful through my life. Be mighty in my life. I want to glorify you with my life. And then he answers that prayer by bringing you pain. And you say, Lord, take it away. Take it away. Maybe at this point we have to ask ourselves, do you want God's power to be perfected in your life? Do you desire that that the glory of God would be shown through you in greater measures. And if you do, pain may be the pathway towards that. Third explanation. I might do some exegetical gymnastics here, I'll tell you that. Just, I'm warning you. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses. Now, this is the ESV translation. You go over to Blue Letter Bible, and you click on the word content there. And it, it's actually better translated, in some translations, use the word pleased. I am pleased with my weaknesses. Then you click on that word pleased, come on somebody, and you see how the Greek word there and where it's used in other places in the New Testament, and what you find is this word pleased is the same word when God looks down at Jesus following his baptism and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is the same pleased that Paul is alluding to about his pain. God looks down on Jesus after the baptism and and has a pleasure in his son. And so I'm going to make a jump here. All of all of the scholars you can this might not be it could be out of bounds. I'm just telling you now, but I'm giving it a shot. Pain produces a supernatural pleasure. The third helpful explanation for pain is what if It is producing in you more than just contentment. I don't like the word contentment there because contentment can give the thought of like, ah, I guess I'll just deal with it. But what Paul is saying, and James would echo this, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you go through trials of various kinds. Maybe there is a supernatural pleasure that can be given to us. I mean, Jesus, I'm reminded, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What if the pain that you're going through is a pathway to joy that you wouldn't be able to experience otherwise? In my situation, I experienced the joy of a God who sustains. The joy of a God who, he has not healed me. He has not healed my sight, but he has doubled my vision to see him. He has not healed my sight, but he has doubled my empathy for people who go through unexplainable pain. He has not healed my sight, but he has doubled my vision to be able to see how he has moved in my life in the past, how he is going to move in my life. I think Helen Keller said it best. She said something to the effect of, it's worse to be blind without sight than to have sight without vision. And I praise God for the fact that this is... And this is not preacher talk. This is like for real. There came moments through this disease in my eye where I actually thought to myself, wow, Lord, you would choose me to carry this burden so that I could glorify you? You would actually choose me. You would actually entrust me with the stewardship of this pain because you believe I could glorify you through it? 
Can I just tell you that brought me a supernatural pleasure in my king that you love me enough to ail me so that I could seek you and find you and preach your good news, preach your gospel at a depth that I wouldn't be able to otherwise. I don't know if I'd be able to come to those conclusions if it wasn't for the pain. Pain prevents your pride. Pain perfects God's power. Pain produces supernatural pleasure. That's way too much alliteration for one message. But hopefully, you could maybe just star one of those, which might be the one that currently, in your season right now, you would say, you know what? I think that's what God might be up to behind the scenes. And that's comforting. Now, As we go on to the second part of my outline, one sympathetic comforter, the explanations for what God is doing in the background of your pain, if we're being honest, it might not be enough. Great, Ed. I think I could see what God might be doing behind the scenes of my pain, but if I'm honest, this still hurts. The depression, it's like a cloud over my head. I get it. Yes, there's these biblical explanations he's producing, yada, yada, yada. But if you know how this is making me feel to have lost my mother or my father at the age that I had and not to be able to recover from it, Ed, if you know what it was like to experience that assault or that abuse growing up, I'm glad that you have these three alliterated points, but it doesn't really help Help me. There has to be something more. And I praise God for our sympathetic comforter in the person of Jesus Christ. I praise God. The author of Hebrews, he writes it this way, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. This becomes such a tremendous resource for encouragement. A sympathetic savior, a sympathetic sufferer. And so what I want to do over the next few moments before I leave you with that one uncomfortable question is I want to take you to those hours prior to Jesus being crucified on the cross. I want to take you to those moments. I want to walk you through the passion of the Christ. And I want to point out some ways that he identifies with unexplainable pain and suffering that you might be going through in your life, that you have gone through in your life. Definitely the pain and suffering that we know the people in our churches The people in our neighborhoods, co-workers have gone through. I'm going to put them all up on the screen, and then we're just going to talk through them one at a time. We so often start the Easter messages on the night he was betrayed. That Jesus was scandalously betrayed, not only by Judas, but by those who were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna to God in the highest. Just a week prior, a week later, they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Have you been betrayed? Did someone commit themselves to you and turn their back on you? Commit to being with you in ministry and then turn their back on you? Commit to something to you, say one thing out of one side of their mouth, and on another side of their mouth, say something else. Jesus does not only know that that happened in your life, he knows what that feels like. Jesus does not only love you in the midst of your betrayal, he knows what it feels like to be betrayed. He was unjustly accused the only sinless man, and he's charged and hung on a cross. And at points, you may feel unjustly accused. Someone is saying something about me that is untrue. 
And my reputation in the world isn't what I want it to be or what it should be because it's not matching up with what I have truly done or didn't do. Jesus not only loves you in that, Jesus does not only know that that happens, he knows what it feels like. This is our sympathetic comforter. He was verbally abused. Get yourself down from there. If you're the savior of the world, why don't you save yourself? Some of you grew up in homes where you had parents talking to you in such a way, guardians talking to you in such a way. You've had teachers say things to you that have marred you till this day. And you play these words in your head over and over again. And the hope of the gospel isn't just that Jesus can heal you and comfort you, but that he knows what that feels like. Physically assaulted. What a tremendous resource for so many people who have had hands put on them in inappropriate ways. In a room of this size, folks listening online, let's just not think because we're at a seminary and learning about Jesus and all this stuff that there aren't some people maybe even in these rooms that have faced physical abuse. But to know that we have a Jesus that not only comforts us and wants to heal us from that abuse, but has gone through that himself for real, for real, whipped on the back repeatedly, a crown of thorns pressed on his head. I know I'm supposed to stay behind here. I just got friends. This is not a fairy tale. This is our Savior, Jesus. Let's not be so familiar that we're not in awe of the fact that our Savior really was physically assaulted, nailed to a cross. What a tremendous resource of hope to say Jesus empathizes. Sexually humiliated. Ed, you're taking it a little far. I don't think so. The pictures that we see, everything's all tidy and everything's all covered up. Something tells me, I'm not trying to paint images of your head that are unnecessary, but something tells me that the scene might have been a little bit more grotesque than we picture it on Easter Sunday, on Good Friday. They were not concerned with keeping Jesus' private areas private. This was humiliation. And to minister in a culture where so many people have at the hands of sinners gone through sexual abuse, sexual assault, and to know that Jesus doesn't just have compassion for that, he loves the people who've been through that, he wants to heal the people who've been through that, that our suffering Savior knows what it feels like to be humiliated in that way. And I think worst of all, spiritually forsaken, you could ask Dr. Orge to explain what happened there on the cross because I'm not about to. But for a moment, because Jesus had the weight of the sin of humanity, past, present, and future on his shoulders, heavenly Father God, who he's had a perfect relationship with since eternity past, I don't know, I can't explain it, but turns his back on his son and the perfect unity that they've had for eternity past for a moment is broken to the point where Jesus says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt abandoned by God? Have you ever felt in the midst of your issue Abandoned by God, abandoned by the spiritual leaders in your life, spiritually forsaken. Jesus knows what that feels like at the infinite level. How many of you are thankful for a sympathetic comfort? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Not only one who justifies, not only one who sanctifies, not only one who gives us propitiation and expiation and all the beautiful words around the gospel, but one who relates for real. One who relates for real. I'm going to close with an uncomfortable question. Paul writes in Philippians, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. This same Paul who explains why God was allowing suffering in his life and the things that God was doing in his life, he counts everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He goes on to say in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, when I'm unclear on what a passage means, um, you know, blue letter Bible helps me clicking around with some of the Greek and Hebrew and all of that, but I like commentaries. And so Barnes commentary about this passage in particular, look what he has to say in regards to this verse in Philippians. The idea is that it is an honor to suffer as Christ suffered and that the true Christian will esteem it a privilege to be made just like him, not only in glory, but in trial. And then he says these very convicting words. Are we seeking merely the honors of heaven or should we esteem it a privilege to be reproached and reviled as Christ was? We all want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Come on, somebody. But are we just as committed to knowing Jesus and the power of his resurrection as we are in the reality of his crucifixion and the reality of his suffering? So what's the one uncomfortable question? How committed are you to knowing Christ both in his resurrection and his death? And I think we just need to wrestle with that for a while. As we look at the landscape of the pain in our life, of the pain in our family, of the pain in our church, is the primary pur purpose. So he here's the thing. I mean, got two minutes here. Sure, God can glorify himself through healing and through rescue and through making it all good in short order. But God can also glorify himself through a group of people who are satisfied in Christ without the healing. Satisfied in Christ even though the prayers aren't answered because we see that because of his sovereign love, he's doing something bigger. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. A watching world will be blown away by a church who embraces pain for the things that God is doing underneath the surface that he couldn't do otherwise. So here's the application point, and I'm done. All right, what do I do? What do I do with what I've just heard? What is the explainable pain in your life that you should be boasting in rather than praying away? Because that's what Paul's application was therefore I boast in my weakness then so what might be the pain in your life that you would say you know what yes we'll continue to contend that God would heal and God would save and do all those things but in the meantime I'm not going to be ashamed of what I went through I'm not going to be quiet about what I've gone through or am going through but I'm going to shout from the rooftops this is what's true in my life. This is what God has allowed to happen in my life, but I will praise him anyways because he's worthy. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I know this message can land in a lot of different spots on one's heart, so I pray in only the way that you can that your Holy Spirit of God would connect the dots that your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God would 
Bring the points of comfort where comfort is needed. Bring the points of conviction where conviction is needed. Bring the points of hope where hope is needed. And God, may we envision a world, may we envision a church who, like James said, could count it all joy for the deeper thing that was happening within us, ultimately setting us up to glorify you in a way that we wouldn't be able to otherwise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen.